Chapter 2. My Brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. Now this is meaning if you see a rich man and a poor man come in, don't treat the rich man better than the poor man, simply because he's got more money. Verse 2. For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring in goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, or that of the fine apparel, the more expensive clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? Once again, remember what Jesus said, Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment, meaning right judgment, or good judgment based upon their character and not their outward appearance. Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? Once again, this comes up all the time in Scripture, and it's rarely ever emphasized. Faith and love, they go hand in hand. In the Pauline letters, the letters of Paul the Apostle, he emphasizes both faith and love. As one can clearly see in these verses alone, almost 10 of them listed just right here about how faith and love basically go together with the Christian faith. Yes, you believe that there is one God, but do you love him? Verse 6, but you have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by the which you are called? And we see this all the time with politicians celebrities, all of these rich folk, how they're truly evil at heart and they blaspheme. But you may be wondering, well, what is blasphemy? To blaspheme is to hurt with the tongue and includes all manner of evil speech, speaking evil of God. Albert Barnes noted, there is many a professing Christian who would prefer to be at a party given by such persons, these rich politicians, if you will, than at a prayer meeting where their poorer brethren are assembled who would rather be known by the world to be the associates and friends of such persons than of those humble believers who can make no boast of rank or wealth and who are looked down upon with contempt by the great. Verse 8. If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. This means that if you kept all the Ten Commandments, and then you go to the store and you steal one little pack of gum, you're guilty completely before God. For he that said, Do not commit adultery, said also, Do not kill. Now if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. For he shall have judgment without mercy that hath showed no mercy. And mercy rejoiceth against judgment. Now in order to understand this, back up just a little bit to verse 12. So speak ye and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. The law of liberty offered through the gospel. Remember, you have liberty, you have freedom in Christ. The law of liberty, through God's mercy, frees us from the curse of the law. That henceforth we should be free to love and obey willingly. If we will not in turn practice the law of love to our neighbor, that law of grace condemns us still more heavily than the old law, which is the basis for verse 13, for he shall have judgment without mercy that hath showed no mercy. What doth it profit, my brethren? Now pay close attention. This is the meat of the book of James. What doth it profit, my brethren? Though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Meaning that if you see a homeless person and they're cold and they're hungry, and then you say, May God bless you, and then you walk away and you don't give them food, you don't give them clothing, you you don't give them anything, you just walk away. 
And the keynote in this really points back to what Paul refers to as the new man. Old things are passed away whenever you get saved. Behold, all things are become new. That's what this is pointing to. The true faith of Christianity will change you. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says this, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now a lot of people just stop right there, but go on to the very next verse, verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Once again, James is emphasizing a living faith. And I really like this because Jesus taught this very plainly, even more so than James, whenever he's talking about the separation of the sheep and the goats at the judgment seat. He says that he'll look unto the sheep and he'll say, You clothed me. You gave me raiment. I was naked and destitute. I was thirsty, you gave me water. I was hungry, you gave me food. And this is what he's pointing to. You had the true faith, and thereby you had a living faith that did good works. And this is truly the meat of what James is saying. Verse 17, even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Now pay very close attention to verse 18. This is really explaining all the controversy, and it's setting it all at rest. Yea, a man may say... Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. That's the, that's the key right there to every bit of what James is saying. It's the very same thing that Paul taught in his letters. Paul also wrote, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, meaning the grace that we have been given through our faith will work outwardly. And that we are saved, once again, unto good works. And also Titus 2.14, which plainly details about how Christ gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Verse 19, another very important verse. Thou believest that there is one God. With your mind you believe in God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. What's he mean? He means that the demons believe, they, they don't just believe, they know that there's a God. And they tremble because they're not saved. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? And it's with those three words, justified by works, that a lot of people get derailed and they lose the context right here. Albert Barnes, this is very easy to explain. In this sense, he does not deny that men are justified by faith. And thus, he does not contradict the doctrine of the Apostle Paul. But he does teach that where there are no good works or where there is not a holy life, there is no true religion. The point on which the Apostle has his eye is the nature of saving faith. And his design is to show that a mere faith, which would produce no more effect than that of the demons did, could not save. As I've said many times before, your faith will rule your whole life. Your reliance upon Christ to get you to heaven and for every step and breath that you take, that is the true faith of Christianity. And then some of you may still not be convinced and you'll focus just on verse 21 and say, no, look. It says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works? Go to the next verse. Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, mixed with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. Notice, the main topic here is faith. And just to clarify, this does not mean that the faith in itself was defective before this, and that the defect was remedied by good works. James is mentioning how faith is made perfect by these good works. So he's talking about the development of faith. And he continues to emphasize faith even in the very next verse. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, had faith in God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Now at face value, without careful examination, that verse is going to throw so many off. But observe that St. James says a man is not justified by faith only, putting the adverb in the last and most emphatic position. 
emphasizing the only there, faith only. So he's still talking about faith. He never denies justification by faith, but that fancied one of idle, speculative, theoretic faith with no corresponding acts of love. To which, once again, Paul the Apostle taught as well, this is a good reason for emphasizing faith and love, which Paul himself was quite fond of adding together. Ephesians 6.23 reads, Peace be to the brethren, and love with faith. From God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Answer me this question, my friends. How unnatural would it be for you to say, I love my wife? If you said, I love my wife, and then you absolutely did nothing for her, you that love was never expressed in any type of fashion whatsoever. All that you did was just say it, and that was it. Well, we know for a fact that's not true love, okay? Love has action. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. In the same sense in which Abraham was, as explained above, showing by her act that her faith was genuine. By her act was her faith genuine, and that it was not a mere cold and speculative assent to the truths of religion. Her act, or works, showed that she truly believed God. If that act had not been performed, the fact would have shown that her faith was not genuine, and she could not have been justified. And this is taught throughout both the Old and the New Testament, my friends. Just as James, he's alluding right back to the Old Testament examples right here. It's like with the faith, you have the root. But outwardly, you're going to see the fruit. Final verse, 26. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So in conclusion with these final notes, what James is emphasizing is not a contradiction to Paul's message, but by mentioning a dead faith, a living faith is thereby the key lesson. A distinction is made in this very chapter between that of an intellectual acknowledgement that there is simply a God, which demons also know to be true and still remain damned, to that of an inward, living, working faith. 